Okay, good evening. This is James O'Connor, Chair. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. So, Greg, could you do the roll call first of the voting members? We'll have to unmute them to allow them to say present. All right. Let's see if I got this. Uh, Adam Badek. Here. All right. Dan Dunn. I don't see him to unmute him. All right. Um, myself, Greg Dennis, here. Uh, James O'Connor. Here. All right. Uh, did you just want the voting members first, Jim? Uh, you can do it the way you're doing it. Anyway, I'm just going to go in order here. Um, Jennifer Seuss is not here. We knew she was going to be absent. Um, Yuhan Sonen. Let me just find Yuhan. Yuhan. Here. All right. Okay. Leslie Waxman. Let's see if I get you unmuted. Come on. There we go. I'm here. Great. Uh, Maxwell Palmer. Is Max here? He may be waiting. Oh, here he is. He's waiting. Yep. Okay. A couple more people showed up. Um, I'm trying, Max, I'm trying to unmute you. Oh, here we go. There you go. Great. Sometimes it doesn't take the first time I press unmute. Okay. Uh -huh. Um, Paul Rea, Paul is here. Paul does not have a mic enabled. To say oh, can he, you enable your microphone? I'll come back to him. Sean Harrington is not here, as far as I can tell, to unmute him. Um, Walter Horn. Walter is. I think he's WH. WH? Well, I saw a WH, but I don't we, see we saw a WZ and we weren't sure what that was. But oh, no. okay. Okay, I'm not seeing Walter here. Oh, somebody else has showed up, but it doesn't look like Walter. Um, and William Logan, what well, Bill is here somewhere? Yes, S. Logan, right? Hi, that I'm I'm present. All right. Could you maybe just change your name to Bill Logan or something, just so it's, I see instead of that, instead of S. Logan. All right. Um, that is everyone. No, there's one more. Janice Weber. Oh, Janice. I'm not a voting member. But an integral part of this conversation. Well, I'm here. <laughs> OK. Um, Good evening. This open meeting of the Election Modernization Committee is being conducted remotely with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth and the outbreak of the coronavirus. In order to mitigate the transmission and reduce risks of COVID-19 illness, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Furthermore, all members of public bodies are allowed to encourage and allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. This order, which you can find uh, just let me turn to this. I got a screen share just a moment while I get it up. Okay. You should see on your screen now the order suspending the open meeting law from the governor. And um, it does not ensure um, public participation unless such participation 
is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment as the agenda specifies in item five. Even if the members do not provide public comment, participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. For this meeting, the Election Modernization is committee, a committee is convening by video conference via Zoom as posted on the town's website and it identifies how the public may join. Please note that, oh, I didn't record it yet. I have to start recording. It was already recording. Oh, okay. Um, please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are attending by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to share your computer. Well, actually, screen sharing, except for the host, is turned off. Anything you broadcast may be captured, if it were the case. Um, all supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town website under the Election Modernization Committee as documents uh, pertaining to the meeting. If you uh, have not received them, I will be screen sharing the documentation as well as providing an opportunity um, to highlight certain points as uh, people uh, wish to speak. As far as the meeting ground rules, we're now turning to the first item on the agenda. But before we do so, permit me to cover effective rules for clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I, the chair, will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members inviting each by name to provide any comment, question, or motions. Please hold until your name is called and the clerk unmutes you. Further, please, be, um, re please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps us have accurate minutes. For any response, please respect the, uh, wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do, throw, do so through the chair and taking care to identify yourself. For public comment, after members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment to those who wish to speak and they only need to identify themselves and their address. Once the chair has a list of all public commentators, I will call on each by name and afford three minutes for any comment. Each vote, can take, each vote taken tonight will be by roll call vote. So let us begin. Jim, we've had a, a couple new people join um, since I did the roll call, one of which looks like a, a member of the committee. And, okay. Uh, so uh, should I just repeat those, those names? Uh, just the people's names that, that are in, in attendance. Uh, Sean Harrington, you're in attendance? I, no, Mike's not right. Okay. Um, and then there's somebody else whose name is appearing as Celia's iPad. If that person wants to rename themselves, if Celia's a real name, I guess it's fine. But um, particularly if they're a member of a, the committee under a different uh, name there, um, it would be good to know that you're here so we can add you to the roll call. Okay, uh, the first item on the agenda, as you should see on your screen, is the executive order on remote participation, which I've already covered. The second item of business tonight is acceptance of minutes for the last meeting. So um, have all the members uh, reviewed the minutes? And we've just had Walter join. Okay, uh, Walter's just, joined. Walter, where'd he go? Oh, there he is. Walter, if you enable your mic, he's probably doing that right now. Uh, 
I'm not seeing his mic enabled yet. Okay. Walter, can you enable your mic? It should be in three little dots on the top right of your screen. You'll have to unclick or uh, click the unmute. Or you need to um, establish your mic. Okay, well, Walter figures that out. You can tell us you're here, but I can see you. Um, let's uh, review the minutes. Does anybody, um, well, first of all, if there is a comment or question, you can go to uh, the three dots on your screen on the top right and uh, indicate that you want to raise your hand and then I will call upon you. Oh, you don't have, uh, okay. Yes, um, I gotta unmute him. Okay, where'd he go? Uh, Celia has a hand up. Okay, well, Hello. Sean Harrington, Sean Harrington raised his hand. Okay. So I'm trying to find where those dots are. Do you mean if I hover over the videos where it says mute my audio, stop video, it says rename pin video? Right, and you should have a thing that allows you to raise your hand. I do not see that option. Maybe I'm new. Why don't I? Um, I see reactions. Okay, well, I see somebody just lower oh, their hand. All right, I see that. Okay, does that go away or no? Okay, Celia's iPad 2. You might be trying to raise your hand. But at this point, only members will be speaking on the minutes. Okay. So, is there anybody else that is a member that would like to speak? Vote on the minutes. If anyone, um, if there is no one that would like to speak on the adoption of the minutes, I'll call for a, a motion to accept. If one of the voting members wishes to raise their hand, uh, please do so. Okay. Max? Uh, motion to accept the minutes. I call for a second. Walter. Walter Horn. Um, uh, I thought I, I, I can second myself. Okay. Walter meant to second it. But his, you may want to check the front of your screen and see if your sound is vo no volume, Walter. Can you not hear me? I can hear you now. It's gotten better. Okay, having gotten a motion and a second, I call for a vote. So, uh, Greg, could you um, first um, poll the ex officio members? Okay. Um, that would I be Bill Logan. A, I should have had a, I should have, I'm okay. gonna just make a quick. All right, I'll, I'll start it for you. Bill Logan. Uh, yes. Uh, James O'Connor. Yes. Paul Rea. Let's see, where's Paul? People are hard to find. It's not, you're not kidding. Um, where's Paul here? I don't see him anymore. Okay. Um, Janice Weber. There you are, Janice. Here. Yeah. Um, do you um, make a vote to adopt the minutes or consent to the minutes? Well, I consent to them. I'm not a member, but okay. Well, we're enabling the members that are ex officio to consent. 
I will take a vote of the seven voting members present. So, Adam Baddock, you see him, Greg? There he is. Adam? I, uh, yes. Greg Dennis? Yes. Sean Harrington? Yep. Uh, Walter Horn? Where is he? I got him. Hi. Okay, uh, Maxwell Palmer. He's... There he is. Six down. Okay, yes. Max. Yep. Uh, Yuhan. Uh, you're unmuted. Yes. Okay, and lastly, Leslie Waxman. Yes. Okay, that's an affirmative vote. Uh, unanimous vote, so we'll move on to item three on the agenda, which is an update on Envision Arlington townwide survey results. And uh, for that, I'll um, ask uh, Maxwell Palmer to give us an update. Um, no real Jim, update. Just, I just wanted to ask Jim, should we, um, should we just leave the members unmuted? It's a little bit. Let's okay, see. yeah, go ahead. All right, I'm then, just going to unmute the ex officio and, and voting members. It's just going to be easier than finding everybody each time. And okay, that way we can, each, we can each mute ourselves and then unmute ourselves as we need to also. Okay. That's right. right. Yeah. So no real report on the um, survey right now. We'll have a full um, draft proposal for our next meeting. Okay. Uh, moving on to a report on the warrant articles 21, 23, and 24 that are um, submitted for the town meeting when it's held. Greg, do you want to give an update? Sure. Um, did you want to present the, the draft or? Mm -hmm. Yes, while I'll we're doing bring this? it up. Um, Jim, if I could make one recommendation. Not to, yes. not to make this so formal, but I think that one thing we could do, which I should have done before, while speaking as an example, is because sometimes the videos don't move up for individuals and it's hard for them to see the face of the person and rather for them to scroll to see who's talking, if we could say our name like we do in town meeting almost before um, we speak, that way that individuals don't have to go search. Because right now I've been trying... You and uh, Greg are at the top of my screen, but the others aren't. So that way it's just easier for us to know who's speaking. Yes, not only do I ask you to speak your name, but if you go to the top, you can go to speaker view, and then the individual that is a speaker will pop on the large part of the screen. You'll be able to see them. Okay. Um, so where were we? Um, yes, Greg. Yeah, so um, we, at the last meeting, I uh, presented some uh, rough drafts of the three motions uh, for our articles. We reviewed them and had various comments as, uh, uh, as documented in the minutes. I updated those motions and I sent them to Doug Heim for his review. He ha didn't have, um, any comments on this first one? He thought it was fine. He hasn't produced his draft yet, but it he seemed to have no qualms with anything in here, and I would expect his draft to look very similar, substantially like this one. Does anyone else on the, on the committee have any comments or questions? And just to review for those new, this the purpose of this article is extend is to extend the life of the committee for another two years. And we are expanding the membership uh, by adding one member from the Arlington League of Women Voters and one resident uh, under the age of uh, 25 to be appointed by the um, select board. And the key phrase is right here, all of whom shall be voting members. Yes. Yep. Um, yes, uh, Adam. Sir, I just really quick silly question we, we added a bunch of seats and we've set the 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 quorum in that to be half is there going to be a, is that half of the seats that are filled or half of the seats regardless of whether or not filled 
Uh, that clarification was that it would be one more than half. So it would be eight members will it need to attend in order to satisfy a quorum. Right, but if, if we only have, say, seven people who are actually on the committee because the other ones haven't been filled by, I don't know, the town moderator hasn't picked somebody or the select board hasn't picked somebody, or if we don't have actual people for those spots, are we in danger of putting ourselves on, on hiatus? I don't think so. That that wasn't um, a concern based upon the current history of the committee and the attendance tonight. Okay. We only have two absences and one of them uh, was a significant conflict and the other I could not reach. So I'm not sure. Um, we have also I, relaxed the, the restriction as to who a board can appoint a little bit before it had to be a member of the board. And now if no member of the board, the board could in theory appoint a designee that's not on the board. So for example, you know, Dan Dunn happens to be the designee of the select board right now. Um, if, and he's not going to be a select board member after the election. If there was no one else on the select board who wanted to do it and Dan was interested in doing it, maybe the select board would consider them his des their designee. Um, I'm not saying that's a possibility in this case. I don't think that's likely in this case. I'm just giving a theoretical example of a little bit more flexibility for the appointing power to find somebody who's interested in showing up. Um, a question uh, here, Sean Harrington um, speaking. I see that we have it listed one resident under the age of 25 to be appointed by the select board. Um, out of curiosity, I mean, do it so kind of that a little bit on to this point of if we can't find a 25, I mean, I imagine we'll find someone under 25 that's interested, but in the case we don't find someone under the age of 25, how does that just stay vacant until we do? And at the same time, um, I guess my other question would be, um, is it that their term would abruptly end once they turn 26 or how would, how does that play out? Well, as well, I guess that's the purpose of town meeting. These are the proposals, Sean. So well, okay. I think I'd like to leave, uh, that for a later time when we actually conduct town meeting and we discussed the uh, specific report of the articles. There may be opportunity right. for amendment or substitution. So right. are there I, any, before you, go ahead, did you have one more question? Yes, I, the only reason I'm bringing it up now is I think it's good to think of those answers now so that way we have them prepared for when town meeting comes around and the only other thing that I have to add on to it um, is when it comes to uh, if we have someone 25 is if we had considered whether or not to add someone from um, the senior uh, center or the or, or a group from the opposite end to ensure that someone in an older age group was here now being active in <laughs> Being active in town politics, I've always, you know, I've tended to be one of the younger people active, but, um, and the average age is higher, mainly town events, but that's not always a guarantee. So it was just some two cents to put out there. And with that, I'll shut up. Okay. Any other members wish to discuss Article 21? I will take Sean's question about the age, whether that's the age at the date of appointment, which I assumed it was. I will put that to Doug Heim and see if he wants to clarify it further in his draft. It's only for two years anyway. Sorry, this is Leslie, but it's only for two years anyway. So at most they'd end up being 27. I have a question. Did you, yes, uh, Janice. Um, isn't there a little age discrimination, picking ages to be on a committee? Excuse what's, me? What's the purpose of having somebody under 25? What difference does it make? Well, I think we were, uh, in our discussions at the last meeting, 
when we talked about members, it was uh, partly a recommendation of the League of Women Voters that we include the young folks and um, we're trying to get more people actively voting. So um, it was a, a concern to try to include someone under age 25 so that we have a, a better representation. Okay. This is something that we can further discuss at a town meeting. Uh, thank you for that thought. Uh, anyone else? Okay, absent of that, let's move on to Article 23, which is the Home Rule legislation for the consolidating town meeting member elections. Greg, do you want to discuss that? Yeah, um, so everyone, uh, for those not familiar, we are simplifying the process when there is a vacancy in town meeting today, um, a vacant, a midterm vacancy generates a separate election on the ballot, which you'll see your normal four, three year seats for town meeting, but you might also see a vacancy in the one year or two year seat, which creates some confusion for new town meeting, new people running for town meeting. Um, and uh, creates a, str a strategic question which race they run in and can create some perverse results in which somebody, you know, gets 100 votes, but should, you know, uh, places fifth in the three year race and somebody with a couple write in votes gets in on a one year or two year vacancy seat. So we'd like to ensure that the person with the most votes wins the seats. Um, this was all three of these motions, by the way, were um, all, th all three of the these motions or the the articles were endorsed unanimously by the select board. And I've heard a lot of positive comments about this one in particular, because this is the way that we um, run town meeting elections when when precinct lines are are redrawn. We looked at the draft last meeting. Um, there was uh, Doug Heim had a few uh, minor language changes that I updated here. The one outstanding question, there was a question, um, I believe from Adam, uh, he, he asked, and it was one that was on several of our minds, you know, what happens when there's a tie that's not affecting the division between terms of the tie affecting who is elected? And I put that to Doug and he was a little bit reluctant to include that language here because he thought it was somewhat out of scope because this, uh, this language is only pertaining to what is, we're changing with respect to the election, determining the division of, of terms. Um, the rule is, is if throughout Massachusetts for all offices, if there's a tie that affects who's elected, none of those people are elected. That's a failure to elect. Uh, but, you know, I asked whether we could include some language to the effect of, that, you know, not, none of this shall change the current practice in which something something you know in which no one is elected if they're if the tie affects who's elected um, he said he would work on that and try to include something that in his draft but he did not yet that's where we are um, but he was happy he was largely happy with the, the draft we had Do any members have a question or a comment Seeing none, let's move on to Article 24. Uh, wait a minute, what's it doing here? Which is um, legislation regarding ranked choice voting. So Greg, do you wanna discuss yeah. that? This is the one that was most substantially redrafted since last time. The sentiment last time was that we should and from Doug Heim was that we should spell everything out. So um, I took standard fair, uh, standard model legislation um, and made a few changes to try to make it consistent with the statewide ballot initiative for ranked choice voting that's going on, um, but mostly based on the model legislation. And I uh, sent this to Doug. He was largely happy with it. He didn't have time to dig into it in detail, but he said it looked good. Um, there was a question, he's researching a question as to whether we can change the housing authority elections at the local level, because 
those are more prescribed from the state. He's looking into that. Um, and I know that uh, Leslie spoke to me individually and said that she had some um, potential suggestions for improving the clarity of this, uh, the clarity of the, the language here. Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't know if you want. <laughs> Do we want to, we, yeah, we could, Jim, are we gonna, do we going to want to go into um, more detailed? Um, well, any member can um, address any questions or concerns that they have. Leslie, did you have one? Yeah. Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay. I just, um, I just looked at it this afternoon for the first time and I didn't have time um, to get too detailed into, but I thought a lot of the way it was written, um, and I know that Greg said that he got a lot of it from model um, language, but I was looking at it and I don't know if it's um, that was that were made, but some things I, I think could be explained a lot clearer. I looked at Minnesota's language this afternoon, which I think is a lot like what we're trying to do because they have both um, single and multi seat and I, I think some of the things that are similar they said it a little clearer and I, I think that um, I don't know when we have to vote on this language but I can work on it some I have some ideas of some things that I would edit and I have also I had some things that um, I might ask Greg why they were included but um, specifically some of this stuff about skipped rank and what makes a ballot invalid and also about overvotes that I was surprised that they read this way. Um, I might have been misunderstanding what they were intended, but I don't, I don't think that it would be easy to go through in this meeting right now. I think it would be easier if I could write some stuff up for the next meeting maybe. Okay. Just, um, but that time-wise, I don't know when we have to vote on this though. Well, we don't have town meeting until at least mid-June. Right. So there is time for two more meetings uh, prior to that. Um, so I'll, then, I'll make a motion that Leslie uh, draft, a, uh, work on it on a, on a revised draft, with some, work with me on a revised draft for added clarity um, and present that at the next meeting. Second. Is there any other member that has a question or comment or concern? Um, questions about what Doug Himes looking at this Sean Arrington here. Um, my first one is, is when it comes to the housing authority, is it the restrictions in regards to, I know that one of the elections I believe requires that you have to be, I, I guess state law requires that you have to have uh, someone who lives within the uh, under the under public housing or subsidized public housing, I believe, to be on the board, and I think one's appointed by the governor. Is that what he's looking into exactly, or do we not know just yet? Does he not clear? He didn't that? have a specific concern like that. I, he didn't have a very he didn't have a specific concern. He just had a sort of general concern that well, housing authority is sort of prescribed by the state and I got to go look to see whether or not anything okay. that the state prescribes would be, would conflict with this. That was it. All right. Any further questions? And I'll entertain uh, a second to Greg's motion to continue to work on it with Leslie. Sean, second. Is there a second? Sean, second. second. In favor? Aye. 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 Some people have themselves muted, I believe. Okay, well, let's uh, let's do a roll call. Oh, Maxwell Palmer raised his hand. Uh, where is he? There he is. Uh, I I couldn't unmute myself. Okay. Hmm. That's often a problem I have. Let me see. I could unmute people just to ask them. <laughs> yeah, why don't Adam? we take a roll call vote because we should really do that. Okay. So Adam Baddick. In favor. Greg Dennis. Yes. Sean Harrington. Yeah. Walter Horn. Aye. 
Maxwell Palmer? Yes. Johan Sonan? Sonan? In favor. Leslie Waxman? Yes. Okay. Um, and for those members that are ex officio, William Logan? Is he there? He's, not, he's muted. Well, let me unmute him. I, I'm here. Someone said I was muted again. But uh, you're, I vote you're in not favor. now. I'm in favor. Okay. James O'Connor, I'm in favor. Paul Raya. He's gone. And uh, Janice Weaver. Unmute her just in case. There she is. Just to vote on what, um, Leslie consolidating the information. Yes. Yes, I vote yes. Okay, so that will be a unanimous vote by all voting members and a consensus of the ex officio members. So then we move on to the next subject matter before the meeting, and that is town election. Saturday, June 6, 2020 has been postponed. And on the town website, there is declaration that was presented. Let me find it on page 21. That uh, pursuant to chapters 45 of the acts of 2020 on March 31st, Arlington Select Board unanimously voted to set the new date for Arlington's annual town election, Saturday, June 6, 2020 from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. By law, voter registration is also extended May 27th, 2020. Residents are further advised of additional means of voting for rescheduled elections given present health concerns. First, any resident taking precaution related to COVID-19 in response to guidance from a medical professional, local or state of health official, or any other civil, civil authority is considered eligible for absentee balloting for this election only for section four of chapters 45. Second, residents will be able to request ballots for early voting exclusively by mail for section five of chapters 45. Chapter 45 of the acts of 2020 has been um, included in the packet, which uh, you can download from the town website. It further states, in coming weeks, the town clerk's office will develop further guidance on both absentee and early voting by mail, including application processes for receiving and honoring such requests. And I present to you a copy of the early voting application, which is available on the state website and um, is in the packet. And now I'd like to ask our um, acting town clerk if you would like to uh, discuss this matter. I'm gonna unmute you, Janice. Well, first of all, I'm not the acting town clerk, but um, the assistant town clerk. I feel as though I was going to audit some early voting applications, but to be truthful, they are one and the same now because you can't come into the office to get your application as you could before and vote at the counter as you could before and we don't know when that's even going to be available. So with that said I'm still going to order a few more early voting applications because some people feel that that's they don't they feel uncomfortable doing absentee voting when they're not going to be absent but you're right it they are one in the same and anybody can mail one in fax one in as long as your signature's on it, we, we have it. And we have hundreds now, so that's what we're dealing with, just getting those out. And we intend to get them out by May 15th. So any candidates that want to send out any of their mailings, that's the date we're planning on mailing out the absentee ballots. And right now, currently, we're getting those ready. Okay. Um, as Janice clarified, um, consistent with, uh, let me find the page 22 of my, um, let's take a second to pull it up. Right here, um, the uh, voting by mail is stipulated by the Secretary of State's website is that 
It's been updated, as Janice mentioned, and you do not have to um, submit an official form. You can write a note, send an email, but you need to have, actually, you need to have a signature on the request. There, is that correct, Janice? Yes. Okay. Um, at this point in time, are there any questions or comments from voting members? Um, Sean Harrington again. Um, one, I think first and foremost, you know, thanks to the select board and town clerk's office for, uh, you know, handling all this during a very difficult time. This is not easy for anyone. I know that on top of this, what people also don't realize with elections are people are having to collect signatures in order to get on the ballot because uh, the legislature has not done anything toward that and, and, and having to diminish the uh, candidates uh, requirement in order to do that. So it's a very interesting time for everyone. Um, my only thing is that I think that and we have no control over the election date um, or what the select board chose. I do think that um, in, the, uh, in the future, uh, even though we're about election modernization, that this is somewhat in our bailiwick. Um, uh, my only concern is whether or not, uh, um, hopefully we are pat, hopefully, you know, we're, we're past the peak at that point, but you know, models are changing every day. I just saw a model for the Southeast. that says that, um, or heard some word in the Southeast that states are looking to push back their stay at home orders all the way till June 4th. And do we know anything from the select board if what happens in the case that Governor Baker does push that, exec that executive order back even further, I guess? Do we have a backup in that regard or do we, is that just not for us to know yet? I don't believe we know that answer, but let's, uh, okay. let's uh, see if any of the other members have a comment. Adam Baddock? My yes, Adam. Yeah, all right, perfect. Um, I was a little confused by something Janice was saying about requests re requiring a printer. Um, from, from the materials distributed, it, it looks like pretty much anybody who wants to, to vote by, by absentee or vote by mail can, can do so pretty easily. Um, I'm not sure that they would need a printer. It, it says uh, on page- um, I didn't say they needed a printer that was in the materials that was just up a minute ago. But I didn't say that. No, this says oh, okay. are available. And um, it also says you may send a note. Right, okay, so yeah, here where it says if you do not have, yeah, okay. I just wanted to make sure that was clear that, that we are able yes. to provide a, 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 a vote by mail option to anybody who, who, who wants it, regardless of whether or not they have technology available to them. Yes, that's, that is true. Okay, good. good. Okay, Greg, did you have any comment? I don't know. I have a question. This is Johan speaking. Okay, Johan. Uh, do we know in advance uh, how many we're going to print for the town? Uh, do we have any expectation of how many will vote at home in essence? Well, we ordered about uh, 500 more than normal. So we have 800 per precinct. And we can use, if we do run out of absentee ballots, we are allowed to use the regular ballots. So we have 800 absentee ballots that say on it absentee, but we are allowed to use the regular ballots that go to the polls if we do run out. <laughs> which I doubt we will because we uh, can't even move in our office right now. We have so many boxes of ballots. So that's about what's seven, close to 17,000 ballots. And that's oh, yeah, at least, no, probably more. It's 21 that's... precincts. Don't forget right. we have to have separate because of the. Um, right. You know, so 21 times, it was 800, 700. Um, I think absentee we had, I think we have, I have to remember what I ordered. I think maybe 500 absentee per precinct plus they send us the, um, about a thousand to 1500 of regular ballots per precinct okay 
So I think we're covered. Yeah. It's just something to consider like uh, if, I mean, if half the people stay at home, can we, you know, can we accommodate if two thirds, yes. if every single voter sits at home, just like, you know, what are the max crazy cases? I know. Well, the, those are the people that are probably going to the polls and there's plenty of ballots for them. That's for sure. <laughs> I, I do have a question. This is Greg Dennis. I do have a question, actually. Um, will these ballots be, are we going to be counting them with our new voting machines? No, we decided the select board in um, our office decided it would be um, easier to wait until the primary only because we had the March election and then, then this one was supposed to be right on top of it. So we didn't want to start having to rush to train people and learn the new machine. So we thought we had the whole, you know, we'd have basically the summertime to get that all underway. So we decided, all of us decided to save it for the prom, the September primary. So we're not, are, having, we're not getting the new machines until then. Are the new machines, by the way, this is a little bit unrelated, but are the new machines, are they the LHS ImageCast ones or? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I'd like to call but, upon Maxwell Palmer if he has any comment so that each member has a chance to speak. Uh, no comments on this one. Okay, and Leslie Waxman. I was just wondering whether you already sent out any absentee ballots before we knew the election was going to um, be moved and whether or not, because you had said something about all the absentee and early voting ballots going out May 15th. I didn't know if that was um, for every, even if they had applied for all elections at the beginning of the year or if some of them have already gone out. No, none of them gone out. When we first um, had the applications, we didn't have the ballots that we didn't okay. have the ballot right oh, okay right and we decided it would be um it would only be fair to the candidates to not to send them out you know too early because obviously people would have voted and then they may not even know who the candidates are so right. we thought may 15th would be a good date and then the candidates would know that and they could get their um information rather than get it out too early and have people forget it or whatever that was the date well actually i decided on it so that's when they're going, we're hoping they go out. <laughs> we're still typing away on those envelopes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I don't bring this up here, but I don't know um, if you use, um, I work for the City of Cambridge Election Commission and we use VRIS, we use the labels that you can print right out of VRIS for your absentee. Uh -huh. That would save you any time, especially if you can't. Yeah, but we still have to do um, all the uh, the people that are out of. Um, that was another problem we ran into. People that the kids that were at school and everything. Well, now they're not at school, but we have to check with every single one of them to yeah. see if they're home or yeah. whatever. So that's tying it up a little bit. We just we have just the, the labels are very easy to make. I mean, we just have them and run them off, so it's not a big deal. But um, that's the other problem. That, it's not a problem, but yeah, you know, no, I, I I'm glad you thought of that actually. Yeah, yeah we of... did. I, I yeah. It's good to check with And them, also yeah. the people that went to Florida, some of them come home now, some of them don't. So we really have to go over everyone that's um, out of the state. And now, and also, um, I still have to check into this. I don't even know if this is a town ordinance or what, but we're not allowed to email the um, overseas ballots. We have to snail mail them. Yeah, so not for this election. Oh, it's I only know, for federal. It doesn't um, make any sense, but. Um, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to try to get those out a little bit earlier, but. That's going yeah. to take a while, so we'll see. Walter, did you have a comment, question? No comment. Okay. Let's move on to Walt, William Logan. Oh, as the one of the registrars. No comment. He, no comment. Okay. I will not make a comment at this time. Our first speaker that requested to share with us her um, and could you make note of the people that raised their hand? So Elizabeth Dre raised her hand. But the first person up is Patty Muldoon from the League of Women Voters. And I will bring up her documentation as she delivered to me. Hi, everyone. Thanks for hearing me. Um, since I wrote this on Sunday and got it approved by our League of Women Voters Board. I have since talked to the state's 
um, legislative chair who's part of the, I love this name, Election Modernization Coalition for the state. And I've talked to Rep Garbley and the Secretary of State's Legislative Director and the Secretary of State's Election Division Director, all of which have modified my proposals. So what you see before you is no longer what I, I am supporting. Our board is meeting tonight in our regular time, so they're looking at my new recommendations, but I could not get them to you in time. We are, I'm no longer recommending that we do number one at all because it just does not seem feasible prior to our June election because the state legislature has, is, is not gonna do that uh, while they're in an informal session. It's, um, so I would like to skip that part. Um, so rather than looking at those, if, um, I'm looking at my own recommendations as I have modified them and I'd like to just read them. Okay. And, and we'll go back to this page. Thank you. Um, application for no excuse absentee ballots. Um, the town shall mail all eligible voters information on the new election date and process. And the mailing should include the ballot request forms along with information on how to find the form on the town's website and how to send the information that could also go by email. Um, so that that can be done by sending a request to the clerk's office. And as you've already discussed, it, it doesn't even require their official form. It just needs the basic information of, well, I don't need to go into it. Um, the voters could take a photo of it and just email that in as an attachment. Um, so adding in multiple options would be helpful. Um, I think the clerk's office is, is gonna be really struggling to maintain all this work that's, that's coming up for them. But um, we think the, the mailing should include uh, a recommendation for voters to get their votes in as, as soon as the office is willing to receive them um, because of the additional workload. So that was just one on the application. And the second is on voter education. Once a, a new plan for this election is in place, the town should undertake a multi-platform outreach campaign to inform the voters of the election changes and new safety procedures. So this would encourage voters to, to vote by mail under the current state approved process, which is only good till June 30th. And then the legislature is gonna have to um, vote again on new procedures. We recommend that the mailing information that, we're, that should be mailed out to the voters should also include links to uh, the League of Women Voters and ACMI. Uh, for information on the candidates. Um, since we could not hold a candidate's night, the voter's guide is available online, but no one can pick it up because everything's closed. So it should, we recommend that that information be included as part of voter education. Also recommending that the town put absentee ballots in the local stores that are still open, not absentee ballot requests, excuse me, in local stores that are still open and use social media, ACMI, the Arlington Advocate for additional distribution methods. So that's on voter education part. We're also recommending that the town establish ballot drop boxes for those voters who prefer to return their paper request. And the only reason that I see for that is it, it um, is becomes necessary because the lack of a stamp or cost shouldn't be like a poll tax. Uh, there should be no cost in voting that could potentially deter any voters. Um, the election day. Concern with safety during the pandemic, we know that many voters and poll workers will choose to stay home, but provisions need to be made for in-person voting. 
So recommendation that the town consolidate polling locations. And um, I found out that uh, the hours can be reduced too. The state only requires four hours. So uh, that's a consideration. Department of Health and Human Services should help select polling locations to ensure that there's adequate distance and issues like that. And they should um, establish and monitor the safe voting protocols that meet their criteria. The town should determine whether it's feasible to potentially establish drive-through in-person voting, which I understand some towns are doing. So just explore that and provide all election officials with sufficient personal protective equipment, the PPEs, uh, for the in-person voting. And voters um, should use their own black or blue ink pens, um, but again, the town would have to provide sanitizer for those who need to use the town's pens. So those are just some thoughts on election day. The administration, this is a lot of ideas all at once, sorry about that. The town should make it a priority to um, order additional envelopes as needed for the mailing, just because the state has informed us that there aren't enough print houses, they can print things uh, like ballots, but uh, getting the envelopes ordered turns out to be a problem. There's limited capacity. The town should reach out to election officials to, you know, the poll workers, to determine how many will still agree to work on June 6th. Um, because a lot of them are gonna say no. A new plan to carry out successful voting should be developed as soon as possible for the number of poll locations and the number of required election officials. So we're recommending consolidation for that day. If the number of workers is insufficient, the town should undertake an aggressive outreach campaign to build up the workforce and add them to the payroll in advance of election day. All election related staff must be given paid training and uh, we're aware that the Secretary of State's office will provide election worker training, but additional training will be needed, um, we think. The town clerk's office and the select board may need to add additional personnel to handle all of these votes by mail. Um, if that's the case, a working group should be formed of officials and volunteers to accomplish this election and to plan for more changes which we are expecting. Um, the legislation is being drafted now by the coalition and the Secretary of State's office for more changes for come the fall. So um, we think it's gonna really require a lot of different groups coming together to make this a successful election and our future elections successful. So good luck to the town clerk's office and I'm, pleased to see that all the three candidates for the office are here to join in this discussion. Okay, I will call on the next individual and I've muted everyone. Uh, the next person who requested to speak was Patty uh, Sattel. So let me unmute you and I call upon Patty. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, so what you see on the screen here are really just some thoughts um, and I want to say first that even though I am an employee of the town, I'm speaking as a resident and a candidate. I'm not representing the town in any way. Um, I am glad to hear that there's a little bit of clarity on how the election is going to proceed during what are really unprecedented times. Um, I, I think a lot of this, and I'm not going to go through every bullet point here, will uh, echo what Patty Muldoon just said. Um, you know, we don't know really what um, June 6th uh, will bring um, in terms of the pandemic. Um, uh, I, I think it does make sense to think about consolidating uh, precincts, we know seven and nine are out anyway because you can't get into Chestnut Manor. And then other than Town Hall, all the other polling locations are at schools, which may or may not be open on June 6th. Um, so um, these are just uh, some thoughts here that if we did go ahead and uh, use Town Hall, 
Uh, it's, you know, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, it's accessible, there's parking, we have experience there. Um, and, um, you know, it obviously addresses the issue uh, that Patty Muldoon just mentioned about having fewer election workers. I mean, we need to be really careful because many of the election workers are in, um, you know, that class um, that is more susceptible to getting COVID. Um, and here there are also some bullet points about, you know, how we uh, protect those people, how we sanitize, um, and then again, just how we screen and train and, and whatnot. A couple of interesting points that I thought were in the last couple of town elections, uh, the voting was about 4,900. If you looked at 2017, there were only 2,200 people that voted. Um, so we're not talking out of 33,000 registered voters, like a ton of people that are going to, uh, that are expected to, to, to vote. Um, and I just made a note here, the red gym at the high school is absolutely my favorite location. Uh, whether it's an election or it's a flu clinic, once you do incident management, uh, it's it's all the same. Um, so logistically, the high school I think is the the red gym is the best location. That's the day of the AHS graduation, so that location is out. So we may want to give thought, or the town may want to give thought to consolidating the precincts down into um, into town hall. Uh, if you want, I'll just go through the, the rest of these here. You know, and people have talked about the different uh, options, um, voting by mail. Um, some of them, it, there's obviously cost considerations that um, that may make some of these options uh, prohibitive. Um, the one thing that I, I will say, um, and I'm going to really just um, um, touch on, you know, when we talk about sending a, a mailing to every single, sending an, uh, an application to every single resident, in addition to the cost, we really need to think about the timing, whether it's getting them printed, whether, you know, going to a mail house and getting them out, then those applications come back, then we have to mail a ballot, then the ballot has to come back. So 59 days isn't a long time. Um, so that is definitely um, a, a constraint. Um, I do know, and I think Patty touched on this, that there is some talk about changing um, the legislation so that people can submit that uh, ballot application online. So that eliminates the need to send out the town clerk's office to send out that application and then wait for it to come on back. So um, we may have that as Patty indicated for the fall. But here's really the, the, the point that out of all of this um, that I want to make is regardless of what we choose for a plan, we need to be really clear on our outreach and communication. People need to know what it is that we're going to do, whether we're consolidating the precincts into one in its town hall, um, and we need to get the message out on what the absentee ballot application process is. Because there's really two things, and people talk about an absentee ballot but the, sometimes they mean the absentee, absentee ballot application form, right? Because it's really a two-step process at this point. So I really think, uh, and I've listed just some suggestions here um, for how we get the word out. So whether it's consolidating the precincts or getting information out about the absentee ballot application process, and then as Janice indicated, then mailing those absentee ballots to people. We need to let the public know what the plan is. Well, thank you, Patty, for your comments. The um, next person was Elizabeth Dre, I believe. Yes, I wanna unmute her. Hi, good evening. Thank you very much for taking my comments. Um, I have one question and a comment. My question is, um, has, it, has this um, group now been mandated with running the, uh, how the election, June 6th election will be run? Or who is the town power, the town group who will be responsible for that? I understand that the town clerk is the chief exec election officer. Um, I'm just wondering who will be responsible for making sure all these different pieces happen. So that's my question. My comment is, um, I think that Patty hit on it and I know, and Patty, um, well, both Patties, that it's, 
education, community education, um, in, non, in the non-traditional ways that the town is used to reaching out to people is gonna be really important. We cannot reach out to people just through town emails, the, you know, the, the, the regular media. We have to be very creative uh, about to make sure that voters are not disenfranchised, that voters are aware of um, the, uh, all the steps that need to happen in order to vote. So I'd like to say, we can, I, I can't emphasize that enough. We probably should think about doing that in some different languages um, to really reach all our voters. And my last comment um, is that I, it would be a suggestion to when you send out the application, or if that's something that the town does, to um, ha send out a self-addressed stamped envelope with the ballot um, absentee ballot application so that uh, a stamp or getting to the post office is not, does not prevent someone from voting. Thank you very much. Okay, in answer to your question, Elizabeth, first and foremost, there are three parties that uh, operate the election. The select board is charged with procuring and approving the staff as poll workers. The clerk's office is charged with functionally handling the distribution of ballots, materials, collections, recording, and submission to the Secretary of State. And then, of course, the Secretary of State, via the legislature, if there's any action thereon, will uh, make their uh, decisions known as to what they uh, want us to do as a municipality. But uh, we are not charged as the Election Modernization Committee. Um, actually, what happened as the chair, I attended last week's select board meeting on the 30th. And I was concerned, and in speaking with the town manager, town council, town moderator, and others, I felt it was very important to give the community an opportunity to express their concerns and suggestions, which is why I called our meeting to order, because we not only had business for the upcoming town meeting, but also I thought it was a service that everyone that I've already mentioned totally wholeheartedly agreed that this was a wonderful opportunity to have um, know, an opportunity for townspeople to speak, because we are the only committee that has anything to do with elections as part of town meeting. Um, and then I'd like to call on Mr. Diggins, who, um, could you um, maybe put your video on, Lenny, so we can see you, or if you prefer, uh, we'll just speak from the, um, I'm trying to unmute you, there you go. Lenny, you're up. I don't have a camera set up, so sorry okay. about that. But you know, right. you're not you're not missing anything by by not seeing me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, anyways, I um, I wanted to say that uh, I, I very much support the uh, notion of having a drop off uh, location uh, for ballots. Uh, self addressed stamp envelopes would be better uh, uh, if they are affordable, but but I think a drop-off location would be great, uh, or drop-off locations would be great. Uh, the other thing, I understand the, the reasoning behind consolidating locations for um, voting, uh, but my concern then is that, especially if, if we're likely to still be doing social distancing, aid, and so I'm concerned that we just increase the density in the remaining locations. So one thing we might want to explore is maybe trying to get volunteers, younger volunteers to staff the uh, more voting locations if we decide to have in-person voting, which I think we'll have to do anyways. And another thing too is that uh, if the weather's bad, also if we have like consolidated locations, it might make it even harder for people to do social distancing. So something to take into account. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm glad you're having it um, at this um, meeting because it gives more opportunity for back and forth than you would have at perhaps a select board meeting. Thanks again. Okay, you're welcome. And the next person I call upon is uh, the next person to raise their hand, Julie Brazil. Uh, I guess I wanna, I want to try and be practical. I mean, I love the idea of mailing um, at least uh, 
early voting or absentee request forms to everyone, but I don't think we can get that done um, um, in the time that we have. So I guess I'm curious if anyone has um, asked whether there's an option of piggybacking on an existing planned mailing, um, like a water bill, um, just uh, it's probably the tax bills have already been sent. Um, for May, but I mean, I, I mean, I, I think it's it's we need to try and find as many ways as we can to get information out to people. Um, but I'm not seeing a separate mailing being really um, likely. Um, but what's the what would be the process? I mean, it, we'd have to get the select board to do that and find the money. I believe so. It would probably be um, a function of the select board, the town clerk's office, and. Uh, the uh, town manager. Okay. And, um, if I could ask um, our assistant clerk, do you have any further knowledge of that, Janice? Yeah. Well, first of all, the treasurers would also have to be included because they pay for any postage that goes out. And I think at this point, I mean, I don't know if you realize this, but the majority of people who take out absentee voted vote applications do it for the entire year so they get they automatically get their um, ballots if they you know if they send in a request in the beginning of the year and just this is just for Patty Muldoon just to um, let you know that the post office is an excellent place to put applets absentee ballot applications because a lot of people look for them there um, I think that you're right, Julie, it is a little late to be doing that. And we do have hundreds. I really think the word is out there and the elderly are the best because they always get their applications at the beginning of the year on automatically if they sign up as a um, permanently disabled, basically from a doctor's note and they automatically get a, an application every year from our office. And I, I don't, I think that, um, if there's a way that each precinct could maybe get to some way to notify their precinct members, but I really, they're rolling in, so I don't see a problem there. And people call all the time about it or email me. I mean, I had 156 emails the other day and probably 75 were about applications. So people do know about it. And there was one other point I was going to make. Oh, I, I agree with Len. I was going to say the same suggestion that if you're consolidating now, that's more of a, um, double-edged sword because you don't want to have more people in one space. So right. as hard as it's going to be to find spaces for precinct seven and nine, I think the more space you have, the better. And the high school, as um, Patty said, is an excellent place, but it's graduation. So if they haven't graduation, I don't even know. <laughs> so can, okay. can I ask one last question, I mean, sort of a, a final thought, which is, um, in order to effectively communicate instructions through all of the channels, um, at, at the precinct level, um, the town's recently set up Amazing Arlington, um, which is which is definitely gonna be able to network at the precinct level. Right. Um, and this is an excellent motivator for people. Um, we need really clear final decisions. Um, you, can't, you can't launch a, a media campaign when you don't actually know the plan. Mm -hmm. So can I, Put in a strong request that we really pin that down. I mean, I think our best bet is to just get everybody to mail or email. They can email in an application. Uh, uh, they can email in a form to get the ballot. Yes, mail as long yet. as the signature is on it. Correct. Okay. So, I mean, I think we need to just pick a plan and then execute. Well, people are emailing, faxing, and mailing right. in every single day, so that's a good sign, at least. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess I just want to be sure that when we that we know that's the that's the final plan and that there's not some change looming. Okay, thank you. Okay, and next, um, I'd like to call on the gentleman that is described as C is iPad. Before I unmute you, you need to identify your legal name and address for the record. You're my up. name is my name is Paul Rea. Uh, oh, Paul, you're a member yeah, of the committee. I've, I've been on the on the call um, and uh, for the entire meeting, um, 
and I just wasn't able to figure out how to work this thing. So I okay. apologize. Um, I, I'm wondering. I'm going to rename you, Paul. Sorry to interrupt. I'm going to rename you in the in the. Uh, okay. Um, I'm wondering if we need to have some way of communicating with the, the citizens of the town that they uh, have these options of uh, applying for an absentee ballot or showing up. Um, do we uh, email everyone in town? Do we have a telephone? Uh, uh, communication system. How are people going to know that they have these options um, in this kind of short notice thing? Well, I can tell you that there was a reverse 911 call this afternoon by the manager to give respect to an individual who served in the military, has no family, and right. there's going to be a social distancing. Um, alignment of Mass Ave tomorrow morning at 1030 from DeVito's funeral home to Cambridge line so that with respect from Arlington, we're going to recognize his years of service. Um, so they're able to do that. And I'm sure uh, with the manager, uh, if we were to call upon him to make a reverse 911 call for the purpose of establishing that there will be ballots available at such and such a location if you haven't applied. Um, the registration is available. I mean, we want this to be as user-friendly, I believe, as possible. So um, did that answer your question, Paul? Yes, and um, what's to prevent someone from voting twice? Uh, let's unmute Janice for that. Do you mean if they did an absentee ballot and then tried to go to the poll? Is that what you mean? Yes. Okay. When the absentee ballots are turned into the polling place, um, when there's time, uh, the the people who work there start putting the absentee ballots through. They don't all do it at the same time because, you know, if people are voting, they can't. Once the name is crossed off the list, if someone came in to vote in person and their name was already crossed off, they cannot vote in person. However, if they come in and their name is not crossed off the list, but they're listed as EV or AV, uh, they, then they can vote in person, and that is noted on the voting list as what they did, and then their absentee ballot would not be counted. So they wouldn't be able to vote twice. So the person at the polling place would have to go through hundreds, if not thousands, of names to... Well, we have to check the name off the voting list anyway, always. You have yeah. to yeah, you but just you're, if, you're only going to have, if you're only going to have two or three voting sites, it, there are going to be many more names. Well, and either way, it has to be checked off by the um, the people who work. Yeah. That's just how it is. So it's likely that it's going to take a lot more time. Well, as a warden... It doesn't uh, happen often, I'm sorry. It doesn't happen that often. I know, yeah. This has only I'm, been... In my um, actions as a warden over more than 20 years, I've only had one case where somebody came in to vote that had filed an absentee ballot. Yeah. And what we would do, because of the fact that their name was checked off, I would just simply have a piece of paper of the people that voted in person with their affidavit that they wish to vote in person, and then would remove their absentee ballot market spoiled and submit it back to the clerk's office uh, under the filing that we normally do with all ballots that are cast or counted. So that uh, it would not, I assure you, at least from my experience, it would not be counted twice. Um, the next person that raised their hand for a second time is Elizabeth Dre. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would like to sincerely thank you, Mr. O'Connor, for having this evening. I was also at that select board meeting and felt frustrated. Um, so I'm really grateful for you to make a space for community members to be here. So thank you. Um, I do want to push back a little bit on what I'm hearing about it being too expensive um, to provide self, you know, to whether it's self-addressed stamp envelopes. And what I'm hearing is that there's a lot of ballots coming in so people know about it. I, I 
cannot emphasize enough that we need to think outside of our traditional ways of how we reach out to people to make sure that they understand that every single person can vote and it is so accessible and so easy that even the price of an, a stamp is not going to prevent them from voting, which is their right. Um, the most comprehensive list I've seen is um, Patty's, uh, Patty Sattel, Brennan Sattel's list of all these different ideas which are creative. It's outside of the traditional ways and that is how we need to think for this. So please, we can't assume people know about it. Thank you. You're welcome. Next up is Patty Muldoon for a second time. Thank you. Um, there were so many things to respond back on. Um, the, I, I do want to make a comment about the consolidation. The idea of consolidation is to improve safety. Um, you'd still have to do things by precincts, so you'd still have just a precinct list to work with uh, because it's town meeting members. It's a local election and precincts are important. Um, but the idea is to maximize the number of people voting by mail for safety reasons and allowing voting in person in ways that are frankly innovative so that we can have a, a comprehensive election that will be different from other elections. And I think out of all of the recommendations I made, and I'm really grateful that the other Patty made a lot of really creative ideas too, I think that um, the last sentence that I, I put, I want to reiterate that uh, I'm recommending a working group be formed of elections and volunteers to think through this election and the things that are needed to be done in different and new ways. So elections of officials and volunteers to look at what's how to make this one work, how to get the word out, how to get the information back in a functional way, in a timely way, and how to also look at the changes that are coming down the road. So we need more of a working group because this is a good, wonderful start. And I know Janice has been working like crazy on this, but there are a lot of changes that need to happen in a short period of time. And I think we need more people consistently putting their head together for it. Thank you, Patty. Uh, the next would be the other Patty, Patty Brennan Sattel, for a second time. Uh, thank you. Um, I just really wanted to clarify what happens with the absentee ballot, um, and it really a question at last for uh, for Janice. So, when somebody, when the town clerk's office mails the the ballot, my understanding is that it's in uh, return. There's two envelopes. Right, one has your uh, name and precinct information, and then there's a, a separate an envelope. I guess my so it's a two envelope system when you return it, um, so that your your actual ballot is private, but the outside ballot, and I think brown one is brown and one is white. Um, the uh, one of the ballots has your your name and your precinct um, number on it, and I believe that the town clerk would take that that they that envelope. With your information on it that they have ahead of time to answer Paul Reyes' question, and that's how they know to mark on the uh, poll book that this person was uh, had voted early voting. So that's one of the other ways that we know that people aren't going to necessarily um, be able to to vote twice. So I guess the the question for Janice is, can we just address the the postage? Are are people required to put the postage on, or does that come back, or or do we send them a postage paid? Um, envelope. Uh, hey, first of all, the town clerk's office doesn't open the ballots. The people at the polls open them. So we don't have anything to do with that other than when they come into the town clerk's office, we um, put their names in the computer as being returned. Right. So the only time their name is crossed off is when it's that it goes to the polling place. And there is supposed to be a stamp on it, but I have to tell you, there's tons of them come in and they never, there's no stamp on them. The post office still sends them in. So that's good at least. And it is, it's, that's right. The white ballot is on the outside that they mail it back to us. And, and the inside one is the one that they fill out themselves. 
Okay. Okay, moving on to the next person that um, raised their hand, and that is Yuhan. Uh, where'd he go? There you are. Okay, Yuhan. Patty, very good document. Uh, thank you. My heart is uh, in my throat with one getting tossed out the window. Um, and so how, part of this is we need to figure out what the process is for the next and next and next and next election so that we do change it up so that you can, we can have everyone voting by mail. So the question is, is what are we doing because we have other elections coming up after this? Uh, what's the, how do we get that moving so this becomes a normal occurrence? as an average everyday voting can happen this way. Um, so sign me up to work on that with you if you needed uh, you know, this uh, collective group. Um, uh, you and, and Patty also were mentioning that. Now Julie mentioned something about process and Janice too, is ma actually mapping out and seeing the process of voting and the different mechanisms in order that need to occur during that. Because I don't think we have a good picture where you say this is how voting operates at home, this is how we're, uh, voting operates when you walk in somewhere. Um, and I think we could put something in, in using symbols, using something that fifth graders could read. Um, you know, that even, you know, that, that, uh, uh, that I would also be very interested in uh, working on. But I think the process and seeing it is really important. Um, but I'm hoping that we can get number one sometime uh, back on the, not leave it. Uh, to, to out to dry, we should really still keep on working this. Are you done? Sure. Okay, Janice, did you want to respond to that? Oh, I, I absolutely agree that we the, the more people we get involved, the better it is because our town election is the lowest percentage of any. And I think it's mostly because it's on a Saturday, but that's not up to me to decide because I did a 10 year study um, on a piece of paper to, for the uh, elections for Saturdays for town elections. And the only ones, of course, that had any high percentage rate were the leaf blower and a few other high um, interest ones but other than that it's the lowest percentage and I think it's because we should get more information out and we probably shouldn't have it on a Saturday but that's just my opinion okay thank you uh, the next person that wishes to speak is Louise Popkin uh, yes I just wanted to um, uh, back what Elizabeth said about how appreciative I am personally of having, uh, you're having this meeting and giving um, the public a chance to participate. And also that I commend this committee because I see a really good example here of people being collectively rather than individually right. There's no competition. It's everybody putting their heads together and trying to get further collectively than any one person could get individually. And that's the best kind of deliberation. It, it's ideal. So thank you for that. That's all I wanted to say. Okay, thank you. And the next person is Sean Harrington. Where'd Robin go? had a hand up sooner. What's that? Uh, Jim, just as I was tracking who had their hand up i think robin's might have oh had i'm sorry up. that's that you're correct let me um robin go ahead you're totally correct sorry i was muted um well first of all i wanted to say thank you for taking this on and i'm very happy that this committee is in existence now to take this up um, as a person who supported the original warrant article um, I want to also back up what Elizabeth said and mention that our town elections are so low, such a low turnout to begin with in, at a regular time. And with this pandemic, it's going to be possibly even more dismal a turnout. Um, how are people going to know? I mean, there are so many people that don't even know that the election was postponed. They didn't even know there was an election to begin with. I know that notifications did go out for the fourth, 
but I feel that another notification has to go out for the election to everyone in the town. Um, I just don't, and especially if you're going to talk about consolidating polling locations, how are people going to know where their polling locations are? They'll go to their old polling locations, find them closed, and not know what to do, or possibly just not vote. So there needs to be a lot of information going out. I mean, just for our regular elections, we don't have enough information out. We don't have enough signage. You know, we have a few mediocre signs at a few, you know, a few on a few um, roads, important roads. But really, I've only ever seen about three signs up about the election when it's happening. So there needs to be a lot more visibility and a lot more education and a lot more outreach. And that's what I would like to say. Thanks. Well, I do appreciate your comments. Um, next up is Sean Harrington. Where did he go? There he is. Hold on. All right, am I unmuted? I thought I first All right. Um, first, I want to thank everyone in the public who's participating tonight. It's really good to see the concern everybody has. You know, just uh, um, just to uh, clarify, we're here as a sounding board so that we'll have a place to vent, but we really, this committee doesn't have really any control over these matters. Um, from what I can gather, um, my own two cents on the recommendations tonight, from my own viewpoint, consolidating voting locations, potentially even to as little as two to one, uh, is a very scary idea, not just because it puts an unnecessary hurdle on the voter. On top of that, you have so many people in one space, all it takes is one individual with COVID-19 to get to everybody else. That's fish in a barrel. Um, second, mitigating times for voting while understanding is trying to limit interactions that poll workers um, have with, uh, due to their high risk groups and other individuals in high risk groups from being out, still puts an unnecessary hurdle on the voter. Um, the goal is increasing access to voters during this time. And I think that's what everybody wants to do. But I think that the best way in doing that or for the individuals here at this meeting, if you are not in a high risk group, email the select board and let them know if you're available to work the town election. That is the most important thing we can do is to make sure that those election vo uh, volunteers who are in high risk groups do not have to go out and work the polls and that the town can have people who are not within those groups able to work them and spare individuals from having to worry about that anymore. Um, I think that all the recommendations have been great to hear when it comes to using non-traditional means of, of uh, communicating with, with voters, it gets really tricky. I mean, no matter any, as someone who works in digital advertising and uh, mailing advertising for candidates, I can tell you that there is no specific route that you can take that guarantees you uh, that you're going to reach everybody. Maybe the town should look into doing social media advertising, but I don't think that that's feasible and I don't think it's uh, a useful way, uh, a, use, a, a good use of our time. Um, I think that Jim has uh, given a great idea when it comes to a reverse 911 call. Um, but again, my big emphasis is if you are not in a high risk group, please volunteer to be a poll worker. That is what I imagine would help the select board out right now as they go through a list of, of poll workers that probably by average are in their 70s. And I know many poll workers and I know quite a few who are scared to go work the polls right now. And for now, that's all I really have to say. All right, well, thank you, Sean. 
Um, let's move on to um, Michael Ruderman. So let me come to you, Michael. Go ahead, Michael. Jim, thank you. Good evening, uh, and good evening to everybody else on the meeting. Uh, I, I know I jumped in a little bit later than others, but let me offer uh, this thought that I think we're facing two questions here. What can we do to make June 6 happen? What can we do to improve and uh, facilitate greater participation, uh, easier participation, all the things that we'd like to change about the way elections are conducted in Arlington in general. Now, these may be two sets of overlapping suggestions, solutions, oh, excuse me, dog, no, no, sorry, dog is not invited to the discussion. They, these might be two sets of overlapping ideas, but not all of them are going to work to get us to June 6. June 6, we face the constraints of time and people. We can't throw a whole lot of people at the problem right now. We are limited in, in the days and we are limited in, in, in the ways that we're going to get the information out to people. Voting is so traditional, both good and bad. Some people vote all the time, some never vote. Some will continue to show up at their old precinct uh, you know, polling places, whether or not it's moved, whether or not it's been advertised on flashing neon lights. Uh, it's going to take a lot of work to make sure that permanent changes actually do become permanent. We may not be able to make all the changes that we would like to in order to get to June 6. So I think we need to, you know, be separating out some of these things about how we're going to make the next election happen and then how we can improve all elections uh, in general going forward. And really, that's it for me. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next up is Lynette Martin. Oh, there's nothing. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm not muted. Can you hear me? You are. You, you can, we can hear you. Great, thank you. Um, I'm afraid I had to log on late, but I just wanted to echo a lot of what I've heard here. Um, I heard Elizabeth's testimony, and I'd like to echo what she said. Uh, I so appreciate the mission of this uh, group and what you're working on um, before COVID and, and now um, in this time. And um, I, I agree that um, we need to think outside of the box how to get this information out. Um, I, I think that anything, any updates on the election, we should really strongly advocate for the town to do reverse 911 calls because almost all residents um, have cell phones and hopefully a lot of them are signed up for this. Um, and just lastly, I wanted to thank this committee for um, giving time for all of the public to speak and um, engage on this issue. I think that there's been a lot of desire for that. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Next up is Beth Melovchak. Good evening. Um, Thank you very much. And uh, I'm really impressed and appreciate how comprehensive the discussion has been tonight, particularly um, with what the information that Patty Muldoon uh, presented. And I would also like to uh, repeat what several people have already said, how appreciative I am that you allowed public comment tonight. I did attend the last um, select board meeting. And uh, so I'm, I'm very, very appreciative that the public has been allowed to have a voice tonight. Thank you very much. And thank you for this very important work that you've committed yourselves to. Uh, I appreciate that as well. That's all. Well, thank you. Um, does anyone else wish to speak on the subject matter? Walter. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Go ahead, Walter. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly uh, chime in, uh, uh, echoing some of the remarks of Mr. Diggins and Sean and uh, Janice. And that is, uh, I understand the danger uh, and the you know the concern for safety, but uh, there is a, it, as uh, Mr. Diggins said, it's a double-edged sword, and it, especially if we're going to consolidate um, precincts that I think it would be a really bad idea to constrict the, uh, the hours of voting. Um, if anything, they should be extended rather than shrunk. 
So I, I wouldn't, I, I would suggest removing that from the recommendations. Okay. John, since you've speaking, spoken twice, let me ask if any one of the other attendees, some of which who haven't spoken at all, have any questions, comments, or concerns? This is Greg. I, I can't raise my hand because I'm a co-host, but I did would like to see a um, uh, written copy of some of the recommendations. I don't have, looks like uh, Patty Brennan Sautel has a uh, a document on this on your screen, Jim. I don't think I have a copy of that. that and I know that Patty in, Mouth. That in fact is the only one because she sent it to me at six o'clock. Okay. And I worked to get it, but I could not ask the town to add it to the available uh, documents. But I will send it to all members of the committee. That's fine. Yeah. I just like a copy after this meeting to read through and as well as Patty Muldoon's um, revised recommendations. If we could have a copy of that, I would like to have that handy too. So That's in um, respect to the open meeting law, if anyone requests a copy of any document that was discussed tonight and wasn't able to get it from the website, or it's a new document, if you send an email to my email address as chair of the election modernization committee, I will immediately uh, upon receipt send you a copy so that keep everyone informed as much as possible. Okay, is there anybody else that would like to speak for the first time? Going once, going twice. Okay, Sean, you're up. Adam's trying to speak. What? Um, he's been Adam Baddock's been trying to speak. I'm only speaking because Adam Baddock's been trying to speak for a while and I don't think he knows how to raise his hand in the system so that's the only reason okay why well to... let me uh mute you and turn it over to adam when i get to him on the page there he is okay there you are adam please thank you thank you sean thank you um i think there was something that went by and a few people sort of hinted at it or touched on it but nobody really expressly said it and i think it really needs to be said uh robin and michael and, and walter each got pretty close uh when we, if we make any changes to how the election is run, that is going to create a, a bit of misinformation out there because there will be confusion as to, is it going to be what I'm used to? Or is it going to be what this person told me is new? Every time we add a new method of communicating this information out to people, we create more opportunity for that misinformation. We start running somebody, I don't remember who, but somebody said we should take out a Facebook ad. We take out a Facebook ad, somebody's going to be like, oh, well, do I trust the Facebook ad or do I trust my, the usual? We have to be very careful about any changes we make to, to the process for this election. It's less than two months away. It's two months from yesterday. Um, if we make changes to how the election functions, um, it, it creates opportunity for misinformation, and, and that can be very dangerous. We need to be very careful about that. Um, I do think we need to be aggressive in, in informing people. Uh, I think there's a little bit of confusion that, that I heard earlier about how uh, absentee ballots, how early ballots are counted. Uh, I've worked polls, I, I've been there, I've watched how this works. It, to, to think that they get done ahead of time is, is um, that that's not how it works. They, it, it was explained during the call at one point, I think Janice brought it up, that they're really counted at the same as somebody who votes that day. They, they, they get pulled out of the box, they get run through the machine when there's you know, a, a, a gap in the time. So if we have the same turnout as normal, and it's just more of it is remote, it's the same workload on, on the people working the, the precincts, it's just that fewer people are walking through the precincts. So I, I agree with whoever said, don't shorten the hours, we, we need the full hours. Uh, I worry about consolidating to, to fewer polling places because of the confusion that can bring in. If that is appropriate to consolidate, and I'll leave that to the to the, you know, the, the people who are running this on short notice. But if if it is appropriate, I think that you can't really introduce new polling places. It's got to be like existing polling places, but fewer of them, or town hall. Uh, really focusing on on the risk of confusing voters and making sure that that this is just as clear as can be and as consistent as can be because I really do worry about the unintended side effects of, of leaving voters out by, by 
muddying the waters too much. Thank you. Okay, um, next is Leslie Waxman. Why? There you go. Oh, it takes a second. Um, so I don't want to talk for too long, but I just wanted to say that only changes that I think are really on the table here are the expanded options for absentee voting that we talked about at the beginning, um, which are set by the state legislature. So that's a change that's definite. And the application of early voting, which means you don't actually need an excuse, which only applies to this election. Um, and that's set by the legislature. So that's um, that's done with. The only other things I think still being considered would be the hours and the polling locations. And I would think that the only reason that polling locations should be consolidated is because some buildings that are usually polling or changed is because a lot of buildings that are usually polling locations might not give permission to have the public come into their building at the time. Um, I don't know if there's any nursing homes or places like that. I know that they're definitely not going to want anybody from the public coming in. So that would probably be combined with another precinct. Um, and then the other issue would be if it's hard to find election workers like we talked about. But um, I don't, I, I know that usually, I don't know if it's any different for this, but I know usually you have to have the polling location set at least 20 days before the election. And if there is any change in polling location, there are requirements about posting, notifying people in that precinct. So if somebody's polling location is changed, they will, the word will get out for that. And I think that um, if it wasn't for the fact that some buildings didn't want to have an election at the moment, I would think that you wouldn't want to consolidate because you, uh, for social distancing reasons. Um, and I think you're also, I, actually, I know that the state has said that you can have fewer than a full complement of poll workers at each location, um, which I think is probably okay since I think the in-person turnout is gonna be lower than usual and the in-person turnout for a town election is low already to begin with. Um, so you uh, can have the full complement of poll workers. I think that would still be best because we'll need people to check off the absentee and early voting ballots and run them through. But um, I think it would probably be okay to have fewer poll workers and have all the locations that still allow um, the election be held there. Um, I don't think schools should be a problem because the students aren't in school and it's a Saturday. So I would think that the, and I think that um, if the town needed to pay to have a deeper cleaning or disinfecting after election day, then that might make those buildings happy too if that was an issue. So that's all I had to say. Okay, thank you, Leslie. Next up is Patty Muldoon. Hi, thanks. Um, the reason that I use the word consolidate polling locations is because of, I, I am also a precinct warden. My clerk is 85 years old. Um, we will not have the same group of workers. Um, and we don't want people, because of, of the need to physically distance, we don't want people to vote on voting day. We want them to vote in advance. So once again, I think this needs a working group to put these ideas together. Maybe we'll find that drive through is really the way to go for us, but we need to, have the health department put their heads together with us to say these are what we need to do to protect the workers we need PP, ppes the personal protective equipment yeah there are a lot of components that normally are not involved in an election that need to be involved in this one and we need to pull it together very very quickly uh certainly as my recommendations have have changed over the days dep depending on uh, new information that each of us gets and I've gotten a lot of new information so once again I think we need a working group that involves a number of departments from town hall as well as volunteers who have interest and knowledge in helping make these elections work but this one's going to be different and we need to be prepared for it and we need to plan for it and we need to get the word out so that's my thought we need more people working on this together. 
Thank you. Anyone else um, have something to say? I see Sean Harrington, you raised your hand. Happened to him. Um, Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, Janice Weaver's been raising her hand. I don't know if she knows. I think there are a lot of people that don't know how to. I've been, I increased my screen so I could see everyone's video that's on here. And I see some people have been raising their hand. I don't think they know how to use the raise the hand option. But I mean, I don't mean to call Janice out because she wasn't trying to raise her hand, but I'm pretty sure she was. Janice, are you trying to raise your hand? If you could. Okay. Thank you, um, Sean. Um, I can never find that raise hand button. I found it a couple of times. It's never there. But anyway, um, I just wanted to say that, first of all, the select board has to um, emo has to notify by a card or some uh, formal um, notice when they change polling places. The, um, the skating rink has, has been used before, which is a good place because it's big and people can spread out there for seven and nine. I know it's a hard place for them to get to, but that in the high school. The children will probably, if they go back to school, will be there. We don't know that they're not going to be there yet. And the idea of cleaning the school afterwards is a great idea. The other thing I wanted to say is the poll pads that we used, I was not crazy over early voting, but when we got the poll pads, it worked so well. I mean, we need more, obviously, we only had two, but it's so speedy and um, less invasive of touching everything that I think that it's going to come down to having them um, at every polling place and it'll move everything along faster for everyone. So that's just one other thing in the future to think of. That's all. What is that poll pads? Could yes, you describe we that? Them, we use them for early voting and um, you, you go in and you just have to give your name. If they put in three letters of your name, it prints out everything about you, your, your uh, party and everything. And if you, um, if, if you're unenrolled, it asks you what you want. And when, when you, you have to, you know, punch that in and it puts it on the, on the sticker and you put the sticker on the envelope and you just go and vote and then you go up front and it's everything's written on it. It's very easy and it's very, it's expensive, but it's very efficient. And there, it costs, I think something like $3,000 for two of them. And it's not that they're so expensive, but the stickers that come out of them are of course expensive. But if we have more of those, you can ask uh, Richard Sullivan and his group because they did a wonderful job at early voting and it worked. It really worked well. And they had training on it from the, the um, LHS people. And I think that's another way to make the voting more efficient for people to move them right through the election. And you can have more people because as early voting, you don't have to be in your own precinct. You just, can just go through. So that's what makes it really a, a great idea. So that's just a thought for the future. Okay, since it's close to adjournment, I'd like to poll the members of the committee if you have any further questions or comments or other business that you wanted to uh, entertain. So let's start with Adam. Attic. Go ahead, unmute yourself, Adam. Trying, you won't let me. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm happy. We're doing great here. Thank you. Okay, Greg. Uh, no, no further business. Sean. Um, so, um, uh, this will be my last meeting as a member. The Republican Town Committee will be reorganizing as the, um as the Democratic Town Committee will be. Um, and I have been informed that someone else on the committee wants to take over this position and I'm more than happy to let them do so um, once the committee meets and chooses its uh, officers. Um, so I just wanna let you guys know that in advance that this is most likely my last meeting. Um, as I'm also stepping down as chairman of the Arlington Republican Town Committee and not running again. Um, and I will let you guys know as soon as possible who my successor is on in both roles as chairman and as uh, the representative for the Republican Town Committee on this committee. Uh, I want to thank you all for a great meeting tonight. The only thing that I will say is I'll be sending an email 
off relatively soon uh, to Jim and Greg and the committee and a few other people with some recommendations for going past uh, the current town meeting warn articles, uh, seeing as we're in the middle of collecting census information. And I think that it may be worthwhile looking into the idea of consolidating precincts in general, not necessarily voting places, but precincts themselves, seeing as all our neighboring uh, towns have around seven precincts, whereas Arlington has about 21. Um, so just a little bit there. Thank you all for a great time on the committee and over and out. Okay, thank you. Walter. Thanks. Well, I want to thank uh, Sean for his participation and uh, I have nothing else to, uh, to uh, add to this evening. I think I could speak for all of us that we do appreciate Sean's uh, contributions over the time of his appearance at the uh, meetings. Uh, Max. Um, that's it for me, but I really appreciate all these comments tonight. Johan. Good progress. Uh, Leslie. I'm all set, thank you. Uh, Bill Logan. All set, thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Paul Rea. I just want to emphasize uh, something I heard earlier that uh, I think it's important to try to make this as um, straightforward as possible for the Arlington residents so that we keep people voting in future town elections. Um, you know, getting the word out is going to be very important of where to go, how to vote, uh, so that we don't lose people. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, at last, I mean, not least, but last, uh, Janice. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, I really don't have a voting thing, but I enjoyed listening to everyone and the suggestions everyone made were really great. And I'm glad to hear everybody feels basically the same way as far as getting everything out to um, all of the residents the best way we can. Well, I promise as chair of this committee, as long as I am, that I will continue to endeavor to see that we have public outreach during, before, and after every election. And that uh, I appreciate everyone's attendance. And I'll now make a uh, call for a motion to adjourn. Could so one of the moved. members do so? So moved. Uh, and who was that? Walter. <laughs> Walter makes a motion to adjourn. Second. Uh, can I call I, for a second? Adam? I, I second. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. I believe we have a uh, adjournment. Thank you all for coming. This meeting has been recorded and will be available on the town website. A link will be available to you on the Election Modernization Committee webpage. So please, please feel free to uh, refer to it in any recommendations that you might offer to the town government. Thank you very much for attending and uh, I appreciate your commitment to attendance here. Thank you. Good night.